What's up, ladies and gentlemen? All right, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys have been hearing this whole hoo-ha about cryptocurrency and to the moon and making money on Bitcoin. Well, we're going to be talking to a few people to find out if you can really make money. Let's go. All right, if you've been surfing on Facebook and you've like basically come across people posting pictures of dogs uh, basically surfing or like, you know, gravitating themselves to the moon or rockets, rocket ships flying towards the moon, talking about Elon Musk, they're probably, you know, boasting about the fact that they're making a lot of money because of crypto. And uh, I have a friend today who has... Okay, he hasn't been doing that, lah. But he's sort of someone that I speak to uh, most of the time when it comes to crypto. Mr. Jason Leo, welcome back on the show. Hey everyone, um, yes, we, we we talk a lot of uh, on cryptocurrency. Basically, it's Jin telling me how much money he has made. Oh no, this is a true story, right? <laughs> Recently, uh, yeah. the market, the Bitcoin price dipped a little bit, and this is what he told me. He said, "Oh, I bought it at a high price. I uh, know I bought it at a low price. I sold it for a high price." And then once it crashes, I accidentally bought it again at a low price. So it's <laughs> humble bragging that he's making profits twice. Ay, ay, ay. Until today, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. But you see, uh, the thing is, that's why today I'm actually very happy to have an expert on the show. And you were very, very excited when I told you this. And you were like, I want to be yes. on the show. It's more of like, not, it's not like I, I invited you in the show. It's more of like you self-invited. It's like you open the door. Bang down my doors. Okay, I'm mm-hmm. here. Okay, where's your guest? <laughs> Ladies and yes. gentlemen, today we have a very special guest on the show who probably knows more about crypto than both of us combined. He is yes. one of the founders of CoinGecko. If you're in the crypto world, you probably know about this. But if not, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Bobby. Hey, guys. All right, Bobby. The whole reason why we got you here today is to tell us how to make millions of dollars uh, with no effort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do my best to explain what I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. So, Bobby, okay, you know what? For the benefit of our listeners who uh, just tuned in and probably are a bit clueless about the crypto world, could you kind of explain uh, about what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I run a website called CoinGecko.com, and it's basically a crypto data aggregator or crypto data website. And we track essentially what we do is we track crypto price, market cap. Uh, trading volume and a bunch of other statistics uh, related to cryptocurrency. So the most popular cryptocurrency is Bitcoin followed Mm -hmm. by Ethereum and there's 6,000 over cryptocurrencies and these are traded across 400 different exchanges. So what we do is we get all this information, put them onto one website and display them. You can, for those of you who trade stocks, you can probably think of it as a Yahoo Finance, but for cryptocurrencies. So that's essentially what we do. Okay, so like okay, Bitcoin has obviously taken the world by storm. Even like the aunties are coming to me or my mom says, hey, what's this Bitcom? So I'm like, okay, yeah. It's like <laughs> Bitcom. I mean, like uh, I, I understand the, 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 the theory behind uh, Bitcoin. Okay, I, I, I don't want to say that I understand. And that's why we have you here today. Uh, Jason understands. He's probably more experienced than I do because he sends me articles after articles after articles after articles. I'll read the headline and then X. What? It's true. What's the, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point of sending you articles? I don't get it. See, I only click the articles that say why this coin will hundred times X to the moon. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, maybe this one I should buy. But in a nutshell, let's talk about cryptocurrency. Okay, let's talk about Bitcoin. What is the whole concept about Bitcoin, Bobby? Yeah, so I think Bitcoin was started sometime in 2009, uh, immediately after the financial crisis back then. So kind of like they wanted an alternative financial system to what we already have. And um, it was a decentralized peer-to-peer payment system. So no single entity controls Bitcoin. Um, so like you can think about it, right? Your, the money that you have in your bank is not really your money. It's money held in trust by the bank on your behalf. Whereas for Bitcoin, it's kind of money that you own by yourself. You kind of con- have control of it. So um, I think this came about as well sometime in after the financial crisis. We start seeing the government started spending a lot of money, uh, mm-hmm. printing money out of thin air, uh, quantitative easing. And we are seeing this again this time around after the COVID pandemic where the US government is uh, sort of printing trillions of dollars to kind of pump prime the economy, right? So uh, 
we don't know what is the supply of the US dollar, like what it will be now, what, I mean, we now, we know what it is now. We don't know what it will be in one year, two years, five years, 10 years, it could be whatever, right? And, and, and we've seen like from history that governments over time tend to inflate their money and print and print and then at some point, you reach a breaking point and it goes to um, hyperinflation, like the, uh, the German days or like the Japanese banana money for our case over here. So right. hyperinflation. Uh, for Bitcoin's case, it's very specific. Uh, the supply is very known. Uh, it's known to everyone and it's kind, it can't be changed. So there will be a maximum of 21 million Bitcoins that ever, will ever be created. And this will be reached in year 2140. The way this Bitcoin is distributed, it's not like, oh, um, I'm, your, I'm a friend of yours. I'm just going to give you Bitcoin. No, it's distributed in a very fair manner. Uh, so for example, like if you can think about it, like the, 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 the our current financial system, like mm-hmm. a lot of those bailouts are going to the bankers, right? Whereas Bitcoin, uh, you can't just simply print money out of thin air and anyone who wants to have Bitcoin needs to do some work to earn the right to have this Bitcoin or they can buy it from someone else. So the way it's distributed is quite fair. Um, so that's, that's kind of what it is like in a nutshell. Like the supply is very fixed and nobody can kind of like print it out of thin air. And if you own the Bitcoin, you actually have control of it instead of someone else holding it on behalf of you. All right, but then, then that brings me to my next question. I know Jason got a question. I'll, he'll probably, I'll, I'll get to you, Jason, after this. I'm so sorry, but okay. Who created Bitcoin? I'm like, who's the one person that basically write, okay, obviously Bitcoin is digital money. Digital money means software, all right? Software means somebody wrote some code. Who was that one person that basically created this whole thing that eventually turned into a phenomenon? Yeah, so the person who created it uh, is this person, anonymous person or anonymous group of person known as Satoshi Nakamoto. Mm-hmm. Um, he probably went anonymous because it was such a, kind of a groundbreaking concept that if he's known, then he's probably going to be captured by the authorities, right? Oh. So kind of a good thing that, yeah. So I guess for his own personal safety or for their own personal safety, I don't know, like they, they went anonymous and they kind of released this, uh, this piece of software. And, and then, um, then they get miners around the world to kind of run this thing and kind of, that's how the, big, the early Bitcoins are distributed to people around the world. Oh, all right, Jason's got a question. Jason, go for it. See, but but Bobby, you know, <clears throat> Bitcoin's a Ponzi scam. You know, like it's fake. It's it's not real. You know, who owns Bitcoin? It's all a um, a scam. So, um, I know you talked to a lot of people about Bitcoin, and they have a lot of their misconceptions. What are the most common misconceptions you find, and how do you answer them? Um, <coughs> I mean, yeah, some people say that it's a uh, it's Ponzi in the sense that I mean the next person's gonna pay a higher price, right? I guess I guess it's um it's kind of a supply and demand d- demand thing, right? The supply is fixed and then the demand's kind of like um kind of dependent on how much people are buying in. Um I think a lot for a lot of I think I think this time around is a lot easier to convince people that Bitcoin is not a scam. So I think a lot of people also think in the early days it was used for uh, money laundering, yep. drug dealing, and mm-hmm. so on. I think if you're thinking of using Bitcoin for one of these nefarious purposes for bad intents and all, like, I think just don't use it. Like, like it's, it's, it's not a good idea because every, every single transaction, every single transaction is, is tracked on a blockchain. Uh, I didn't really explain blockchain too well, but, but essentially what it means is that you can imagine a Maybank to you, but every single transaction that is made by every single account in Maybank to you is kind of publicly available. So you can kind of see like everybody's balances and how much money he sent to another person. So if you transfer some money to a drug dealer, like today, 20 years down the road, that data will still be on the blockchain and you, you can still be caught. Lah. So don't think that you're very smart. You buy some drugs today or whatever, then you know, you, you are, you're free. But I mean, technology can catch up because it's there permanent. It's a permanent read only database. It, it will be there forever. Immutable records of this, all these things. Lah. So, mm-hmm. so, uh, so yeah, that, that's one of the things that people, but I think this, this time around, like, like you have billionaires like Elon Musk and all buying Bitcoin, kind of change the narrative. Like what these guys are seeing is they're seeing Bitcoin as a store of value, um, right. as a hedge against inflation. Uh, when they start seeing the US government printing trillions of dollars, like there's going to be inflation, there's money being uh, eroded. So they want a, a way to kind of store their money safely, securely, that can hold value over time. And they look at it as a form of a digital goal yep. um, and, and, and how they can, it will retain value over time. I think, I think Gene, actually, we won a clubhouse a couple of weeks ago and, and, and you kind of explained it really well uh, by using the, the Yeezy 
uh, shoe example by, by yeah. Kanye. Kanye West released 3,000 pieces of Yeezys. Uh, they go out of stock in like 20 minutes. And then people start trading them on Facebook. And every time the supply gets lower and lower and lower, and it comes to a point where nobody... I mean, like, it, it, it has already gone to the end user. I mean, all the end users who've always wanted Yeezys got them and nobody's willing to sell them. And then basically you have people in the market say, hey, I'll offer 3,000. Nobody. Okay, I'll offer 4,000. Nobody. Okay, I'll offer 6,000. Then somebody, one person comes like, oh, okay, I'll sell you my Yeezys for 6,000. And all of a sudden, your Yeezys are worth 6,000. So that's like the trade market. Uh, if 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 mm. that, I mean that's a very layman term of putting it lah. You know, demand and supply, that, that kind of thing. But the difference between the Yeezys and Bitcoin is Yeezys will go down in value after a while. Uh, Bitcoin. Um, how did Bitcoin even get to? How did all these exchanges even exist? Like, okay, so now there are a lot of these like. Uh, so-called platforms where you can go and buy Bitcoin, then trade Bitcoin and stuff like that. How did it even become legal? Is it even legal? That's my question. Yeah, sure. Happy to answer that, right? So I guess, I mean, from, from a context, from Malaysian, Malaysian point of view, so uh, there are three regulated exchanges in Malaysia. So the Securities Commission actually took a very progressive stand in trying to understand what, what is Bitcoin and how it is like and how can it actually help people because like it or not, people will still find a way to trade them, buy them, own it if even you legalize or don't legalize it. So they kind of took a very progressive approach. They put together a legal framework, put in yep. place regulations and they invited participants who are interested in running exchanges to come and apply. So in Malaysia, there are three regulated exchanges, uh, namely Luno, mm -hmm. Tokenize and Synergy. Malaysia, uh, Synergy. Mm, okay. Uh, so these are the three exchanges that are regulated in sec by Securities Commission of Malaysia. So there's a lot of uh, restrictions or regulations of places, uh, things that they have to do to comply with the Securities Commission rules. For example, like they have the money that 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 if you send ringgit, you don't really send a ring the ringgit to their bank account. You send it to a trustee bank account, which holds the funds on behalf of Luno, which can only be used to purchase Bitcoin. For example, mm -hmm. uh, some of the exchanges in the early days, at least, uh, a lot of these exchanges, when you send money to them, it would kind of like enter their bank account, and then there's no separation of what is an operating ex expense account and a customer funds account. So, and, and if the if the exchange goes bankrupt, then like everything goes away with it, right? So. So, but when it's a trustee account, there's more security there. And then the Bitcoin is not like, so the exchange will hold Bitcoin, right? It's not like the, the owner of the exchange holds the private key to the Bitcoin. Like the, 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 the keys to the Bitcoin needs to be held by a trustee. So for example, I think in Luno and all this, they use this custodial provider called BitGo uh, and, mm. and it holds the Bitcoin on behalf of Luno. And, and it's not like just one person can decide to you know, run away with the Bitcoin. There's right. a series of people that needs to you know, approve this transaction before they can kind of move large transactions. Uh, so for example, some exchanges back in the olden days, like 100% of the Bitcoin is held in the hot wallet I uh, mean, the wallet is connected to the internet. So if somebody hacks onto the exchange, like then the entire balance goes away. Right. But now these days, there's a clear separation of a hot wallet and a cold wallet. So like, for example, maybe 10% of the funds are held on a whole hot wallet, which is connected to the internet. And 90% is held onto the custodial provider like BitGo. And then it's like disconnected from the internet. And then like you need to spend, take more, need like multiple signatures, multiple parties to approve before that can be moved to a hot wallet. So there's like more restrictions. Uh, I think... In terms of these three players, so they definitely have all these things in place. I'm sure the Securities Commission have already made sure they, they put in place all these things. Uh, in terms of the, then, then, then there's, I said, I mentioned earlier, there's 400 plus exchanges, right? Then these are all the non-regulated exchanges, like mm. they are located overseas. Right. Um, because Bitcoin is kind of digital or all this cryptocurrency are digital, it, it, it's kind of like really simple to move your coins abroad, like, and move them around like, without any, it's kind of like, it's like how like sending uh, emails. Like, yeah, essentially sending email. Like uh, money is now borderless as well. Like I mean, yeah. back then, I mean, moving money from your Maybank to you to you mm. know somewhere else, it can be done. But like, there's a lot of paperwork. But then when it's uh when it's online and it's like it's like literally like sending an email. So it's that simple. Uh, of course, among the other exchanges, like the non-regulated ones, like some are regulated in US, some could be regulated in Australia or New Zealand and all, and some are just not regulated elsewhere and they're incorporated in uh, offshore jurisdictions like British Virgin Islands, Cayman, Antigua, Seashells, all kind of weird small mm. islands and all. So, yeah. so, so for these places then, you know, it's really based on the exchange's reputation. You kind of like use them based on your trust and if something goes wrong in these places, right? Like 
you can't just go to Securities Commission of Malaysia like, because they'll say that, you know, we don't regulate this thing. We, we, we told you not to use these places, but you still use <laughs> So, yeah, that's kind of... So, so, so if, a, if someone like Luna were to run away, we can go to the Securities Commission and say, hey, man, we got to get these guys and they will do something. Lah. Yep, yep. Do, do you think that around the world, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is in danger of being banned or more or, or governments will lean towards regulating it and and taxing it Jesus. actually actually funny it. funny that you mentioned it uh, jason because like, i know i know like uh 2017 2018 right there were some countries that actually uh kind of like banned like cryptocurrencies uh like south korea they said that they ban all these exchanges and stuff like that. and that was kind of sort of correct me if i'm wrong like a contributing factor for that huge crash that we all saw like you know the crash of all these cryptocurrencies because like suddenly china bans this suddenly south korea bans this and everybody was like oh my god oh my god and they started selling whatever they had and it was that huge crash that all of a sudden uh uh concluded by the media and all these people in the news that bitcoin is a ponzi scheme it's a, a scam it's manipulated it's people basically uh try to manipulate the funds to go higher in in value and stuff like that i mean what's your take on that bobby I think, okay, to uh, Jason's question on being um, text, uh, whether it can ban or not. I think, I think it's at this stage, like it can't be banned anymore. Uh, oh, okay. I mean, the genie's out of the bottle. You can't, once the genie's out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. So the technology is out there. And I'd like to draw parallels to, uh, for Bitcoin with uh, peer-to-peer uh, torrenting technology. So, I mean, like Hollywood and all its associated companies tried so hard to bring down like torrenting. I mean, yeah. all... I think there's Napster, there's BitTorrent and all kind of torrent. Like there's and then the Pirate Bay and all, right? They tried so hard to take down Pirate Bay, but until now, like, you know, this technology, this torrenting technology, the P2P torrenting technology still still works. It still exists. It's just maybe it's harder. It's not so simple. You get to use dodgy and dodgy sites to, to access these <laughs> things. But no, this technology still works. Um, I think it's the same for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a, it's a peer-to-peer technology, but instead of sending music files around online, you're kind of sending something of value that is scarce. That's why that's it's kind a, of like That's a damn good analogy. Oh, I'm going to use that in future, Bobby. Thanks. That's <laughs> great. Um, uh, Jin, if you don't mind, I just want to highlight something here. Um, the reason why, uh, actually Bobby created a bit of a, a stir on Twitter recently, uh, not, not because of him, but uh, uh, Cointelegraph, a, re- a really popular um, crypto news website, actually named Bobby as the he rank, they rank Bobby as 30 in the top 100 uh, influential people in the cryptocurrency world. Very soon, you have um, the Malaysian government coming yeah. to claim, yeah, okay, yeah, Bobby, orang Malaysia. That's right. Uh, okay. Orang Malaysia. <laughs> yeah, kita, kita banyak, kita proud, kita so, proud. <laughs> yeah, kita, yeah, so I, I, I mean, uh, this was a really great, you know, uh, write-up uh, on, on Cointelegraph. Uh, so impressed. And I just want to ask, like, uh, how, how, how do you feel about it? What's your, what's your take? Uh, were you surprised? Did you expect this? You know, did they reach out to you? What's the whole experience like? I'm sure it's exhilarating. Yeah, um, yeah I think I was a bit surprised. Uh, I mean, I've been, in, I've been in the space for some time, uh, quite a few years already. So it's like never appear on any of these top 100 lists in crypto because there's just so many uh, people that are very, very influential. So, I mean, they, they did reach out. They said that I'll be appearing on the top 100 list. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what number. Uh, and then suddenly when it came out, it was top 30. It's like, oh, okay, quite, quite. Quite, quite cool, I would say. Quite interesting, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, they, they miss out my partner. La. I mean, we worked together on this for the past few years, but they only uh, need me. <laughs> your partner's Lee, right? Uh, yeah, TM Lee, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, so I mean, uh, how big is this piece of news for for, uh, for CoinGecko? Like, what's your next plans or steps with this? Like, what's going to happen soon? Uh, I, think, I think for us, is we are business as usual. So for us, is we're trying to build the, the world's best crypto data aggregate, aggregator, right? So right. everyone in the crypto world sort of rely on us to kind of check on prices. And the site, I mean, doing this bull market is just super busy. There's just so many coins being created every day and, and all kinds of things like new types of things uh, being implemented, new technology, new data sources that we kind of have to track. So always just trying to stay really up to date on some of the developments in, in crypto and, and trying to make sure that we are always one step ahead of our competitors. Uh. Right. The, you know, like, so, like for myself and Jin, you know, uh, we, we, we took a, a different path when it comes to our careers, you know, like the usual doctor, lawyer, engineer. We, we obviously straight away from those well-trodden paths. <laughs> and then, you know, when we, when we buy cryptocurrency, people say, hey, why you buy crypto? You know, it doesn't make sense. You know? And then you entered, uh, your career, entered into a career of cryptocurrency. I mean, I have to ask the question that a lot of people always ask me, what did your parents feel or say when you told them, 
Ma, I'm going to do a business in cryptocurrency. What was your reaction? <laughs> I think my parents still don't really understand what I do actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like I'm you're not doing this. a very good job educating your own parents <laughs> about what you do. They, all, uh, they, all they care, no, all they care is like, oh, okay, la, got money, ah, okay, la, okay, no problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, actually, what are your parents? Until you mean until today, your parents still do they approve of what you do, or are they still worried? Like, oh, are you doing something dodgy? I I think I think um, at the end of the day, like I think your parents want what is safe for you, right? Yeah. Uh, and what is safe for you means you have a job, you're earning money, but maybe not necessarily what is best for you. So at the end of the day, you got to make your own decision on what is best. And of course, don't do things that, uh, I guess the key thing is you got to know what, what you are and don't do things for short-term gains. Mm-hmm. Like that's, I think I think, I think think crypto, especially in crypto, there's so many ways to earn easy money through all kinds of scams. Yep. And, yeah. Uh, too many scams, I think. Uh, a lot of people went down that easy route and get the easy money and, and take. But I think for us, for me at least, for our team, my partner and I, we kind of chose the long, 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 longer path, right? We play long games, right? And this mm. is games that we play over a longer period of time, 10 years. So uh, 10, 20 years and all. So like, you don't want to take the short money because like you take the short money, I think Warren Buffett used to say like, your reputation is the number one key priority, the one, number one thing that you should gut seriously, right? Because once you lose your reputation, no one's going to take you seriously and you, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't, can go far in life, lah. Oh, that's true. So, that's very true. Okay, but but I want yeah, so first uh, reputation is very important, lah. So sure. for us, it was just very very whatever that we do is just like you know we're gonna do the right thing because if we screw up one time, that's it. Because all the things that we've done, all the good things that we've done, all before this was just down the drain. So yeah. this reputation is very very key. You can yeah. be you can be spending like uh like twenty years in building something great, and all it takes was just that one big mistake, and you're down the drain. But okay, so yeah. like when you when you mentioned uh, Bitcoin as more of like a store of value, like how our uh, I was about to say ancestors, our parents, uh, <laughs> uh, like you know, uh, used to basically uh, give us gold, especially for yes. really great occasions, weddings, weddings, and then when they ask you, oh why? Because okay, two things that happens in weddings. Number one, they give you ampa with money. All right, the younger generations will give you angpa money. The older generations, your grandparents will always give you gold. And then when you ask them, oh, no, no, because the thing is, we like for me is I don't really wear gold. I can never ever imagine myself wearing a gold chain or a gold bracelet. It's not because of security or whatever. Not it's for me. It's like I don't know. I feel like an uncle wearing it. No disrespect to uncle, but it's just not our thing. But their reasoning <laughs> to giving gold to us is they see this, the thing is they don't even go out right to buy the best looking gold to give you, and you look at it like oh so nice. It looks like shit. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, they, they, they might, <laughs> it looks very unappealing. But the whole idea. But no offense, huh? Yeah. But no, no offense but no. to the uncles who give <laughs> golds who look like shit to Jin. No offense. But the whole idea, the, the whole idea is, is not so much about you wearing the gold. It's about you keeping it. And when you need it, you go to the pawn shop and pawn it for a higher value because the value that they buy it for that day will be different on the day or in the long run as per se. So that's why people, uh, that's why people say, uh, oh, you know what? Uh, as much as you can, invest in gold, invest in gold, invest in gold, invest mm. in gold. But the thing is, mm. when you invest the in gold, no one's going to go to a bloody gold shop and buy bars of gold and put it in their home. You, 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 know, you know what I mean? So now that they say that Bitcoin is digital gold, will Bitcoin actually replace gold? Yeah, I think I think I think there's a very strong narrative, and that's essentially what uh, is happening with all the U.S. institutions. I think if you look at the price going up all the way up to fifty, sixty thousand right now, fifty eight thousand dollars right now, yeah, it's actually really driven by the U.S. company, U.S. institutions, uh, like MicroStrategy, Tesla, buying up because of this uh, digital gold. Um, the Asian companies haven't caught up yet. I don't know why. I think <laughs> just maybe behind the laggards, behind a few more months and all, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about it, right? I mean, our lives, we are increasingly spending a lot and a lot more time online. And, yeah. and when you start spending more and more time online, then it, it seems only natural that people will want some sort of a digital equivalent for everything that you have in the physical world, right? And one of the physical uh, equivalent, I mean, a digital equivalent of a physical item is a goal and people will want to recreate that on online. And, and essentially that that's essentially what has happened. And I think one of the issues as well with, uh, with Bitcoin as well is um, if you think about the internet infrastructure, uh, this, everything is kind of like quite built up quite well, but one key piece of infrastructure that wasn't really built out quite well until now is the, is the financial uh, financial services infrastructure like mm-hmm. it's kind of still quite arcane and still quite hard to transfer money from one person to another person online 
uh, I mean, if I were to ask you, like, let's, without Bitcoin, right, how do I transfer like $100 to you, like, like now on a call, like, right, log into Maybank to you and then, you know, transfer. I mean, if you're in Malaysia, okay, you can get it instant, instantly, but say you are in like, in the US or in Europe, well, then how do I transfer to you and how much will it cost? How, how many days with, you know, it, it's all these things, you know, it's not so instant as well. Yeah. Uh, there's all these rails, you know, and then like, you look at Robinhood, you know, like the, the, the stock system and all, like people, uh, a lot of this thing is a T plus three. So when you like buy a stock, you only get the stock three days later. And then like, that's kind of why they had to stop the games, the stop trading game stop. So kind of, there's all this very arcane financial services. Our, tra- our banking system relies on technology from the seventies, this, this right. box and all. Yeah. I think, so, I think, I think they still have the mentality of like, uh, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And just, just for the benefit of our listeners who are listening in and wondering what's Robin Hood. No, it's not the guy who steals from the rich and gives it to the poor. <laughs> Robin Hood is actually, uh, uh, an exchange that sells stocks and trade stocks. And also do they do cryptocurrencies as well? I think they do a little bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, okay, I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but okay, going back to the fact that our, our grand, our parents or our older generation mm. gives us gold in store for, to, to store value. Do you think, okay, then for example, like for someone like me right now, right? I buy gold. I don't buy a lot, lah, okay? I keep that gold. I physically have it, all right? I put it in my safe. Let's say if I put it, I go to the bank, I put it in the safety deposit box. I have one bar of gold, okay? It's 1,800 bucks per kilo or whatever, whatever value it is. I go to the bank, I see it, it's there. It's, it's, it's a physical product. But Bitcoin is a bunch of code. So how does one mm. accept that a bunch of code holds so much more value than something that you can touch, feel, smell, taste, and even put up your ass, you know, if you want to. But <laughs> I'm just, but this is yeah. something. Don't, don't, don't taste your goal or put it up your ass, especially <laughs> after you put it up your ass. Don't, don't. How does one- That's bad advice. Yeah, how, how, okay, so how much education does one have to do to educate people to appreciate the value of code? You, you get what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a very hard concept. I mean. I think money as it is, is also quite a complex concept. Money, I mean, I guess people understand money more because there is a physical representation of money in the form of a coin and a paper note. Yep. But I mean, it used to be the case that this paper money used to be back one-to-one with, with gold, for example. I don't know what's the ratio, but the US dollar used to be back with gold. But this kind of changed in the year 1971 when Richard Nixon kind of uh, took the US off the gold standard. So, just by signing a piece of paper, a piece of regulation, instantly like, your money is kind of backed by the trust that you have in your government. Oh. Uh, if you trust that your government won't screw you over, then you know your money will hold value. Like. But if your government starts printing, printing, printing money, then, and this is inflation actually, you start seeing, and you start hearing all your, um, your grandparents and all, you know, last time when I was young, one roti chanai only cost 10 cents, for example, but now one roti chanai costs like what, three ringgit, <laughs> or maybe five ringgit more, uh, you are wherever, you, wherever, right? So this is inflation, right? Your money is being eroded uh, every year at the rate of like uh, 3% per annum, for example, official rate, or maybe 10% on an unofficial inflation rate. So, so that's why it's kind of hard to imagine uh, like the concept of money and then and 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 the concept of of of, of Bitcoin, I suppose. Like there's no it's not like an investment like a house, you can kind of see, look, mm. feel, touch, and all like this is a non-physical object. It's like a concept, money is a con- concept. Yeah. Yeah. The, there were there were some articles that I read actually, which is quite nice because they say that in terms of gold, Bitcoin is better than gold at being gold. You know, like because huh. gold is a uh, storage uh, uh, storage value, but you know, you 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 can't. It's you want to transport gold is hard because yep. the physical is heavy, right? Bitcoin is better because when you transfer Bitcoin, is instantaneous over mi- over seconds, over over a few minutes. Then, uh, in terms of like you know, uh, across uh, when you use it to pay stuff, right? Uh, you know, people always say, oh, you know, credit cards, when you swipe a credit card, you pay instantaneously. Why do I need to use Bitcoin? But actually, the the actual time it takes to settle your cash payments over credit card, it's a few days. You don't settle it on the day. You settle it T plus three after that, you know, three days after the, the merchants and the, the credit card companies will, will tablet and whatever. So Bitcoin is also instant. So in that way, is payment and storage much better than the traditional technology. And like when you say stuff like just code or whatever, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's for me, it's convenience. Like, yes, I would appreciate, you know, getting letters in the mail. I can feel and touch it and like you taste it. But 
99.99% of all of correspondence is through email now. And we value email more than letters. If Post Laju closed down, I won't be upset. But if my email, my Gmail <laughs> is down for a few days, I will lose a lot of business. So oh. that is the value of Bitcoin, I feel. Like. It's, it's funny that you mentioned email because I don't think today uh, we value email, we value WhatsApp messages. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's gone to that. Yeah. But okay, see, the thing is when we when I first dabbled into Bitcoin and people were telling to me, oh, Bitcoin is growing, Bitcoin is going to be the future of money. Everybody kept assuming that, you know, uh, everybody is going to start selling their products in Bitcoin. That means like, okay, this, uh, this pizza is going to cost you 59.9 Bitcoin. Like, you know, just like how it's four ringgit 90 cent. So like, okay, so for me, it's like, it's, it's okay. This is what I've been doing. I've been reading and been trying to basically understand the concept when everybody keeps saying that Bitcoin is basically a store of value. So you have Bitcoin. Let's say, for example, you have one Bitcoin, all right? And the value of Bitcoin is 50,000, right? But where the, the, I, I understand, like for me, is I try to basically uh, have this whole go down this rabbit hole to try and make myself understand and accept the concept. And this is how I do it. You basically have one Bitcoin in your phone or your wallet wherever you go. Whether you're in Malaysia, whether you're in Singapore, whether you're in the US, you have one Bitcoin with you. But when you need to buy something, the end goal is to always buy the product in the country's currency. And that's where you convert your Bitcoin into that country's currency to buy whatever you want at that current value versus Bitcoin. Is that a correct way to look at it on how Bitcoin can be the future where people can basically use it as money? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's one way of looking at it. I mean, if you look at it like uh, this is Econs one zero one like what I learned in, <laughs> oh, in okay. university. So there's, there's there's three basic functions of money. So uh, something that that serves as a good form of money needs to be a uh, a good store of value. Yeah. So it must retain value over time. Uh, it must be a good unit of account. Uh, and then it must be a good medium of exchange. So like both parties must want to receive it. Uh, so I think I think Bitcoin kind of at this point in time the the value is very very volatile. So that's kind of why people don't price products in terms like oh this computer is zero point one Bitcoin like right. because Bitcoin price like it could be fifty thousand today then next hour is like forty thousand dollars. So yeah. it's very hard to price it. So I think at this point in time um, everything is still priced in US dollar and then you just pay at whatever equivalent amount. But I mean, maybe in the future, I mean, I don't know. It's very hard to say, right? If mm-hmm. the US dollar goes down completely and then nobody really uses US dollar anymore and then Bitcoin suddenly became a stable value. But I, I find it a bit hard to get to that stage as well because it's just like how gold is not a stable uh, yeah. at this point in time. So um, then maybe people will start pricing things in Bitcoin. But I think, I think people are starting to price things in uh, with stable coins, right? Like like USDC, USDT. Uh, people are sending this across uh, kind of cross border payments and all using these stable coins. Uh, the whole different concept, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So if, okay. Uh, so that means right, if one day Bitcoin becomes stable, can we safely say that the whole world economy or the whole world will be transacting under one currency? Yeah, it's very possible. Do you think it could happen? That means like in Malaysia, you can forget about the RM already. Yeah, I don't want to say that. I mean, mean, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, we don't want to. I mean, if you think think about it, right, I mean, essentially the world is getting very, very globalized and we are all using a single brand in the world. Like all of us, you can find a McDonald's anywhere in the world. You can find a KFC anywhere in the world. Uh, You can find a Zara shop everywhere in the world. So like you can find a Toyota everywhere in the world. So, but like, but money is not there yet, right? So kind of like we are kind of, kind of between this the old transitioning things. yeah i don't know if you're transition or not but like it could also it could, it may or may not be bitcoin as well i mean if you're looking at it that's why i think the governments are very uh against facebook plan of launching their own digital currency because uh. if you think about it facebook if facebook is a country it's probably the largest country in the world. Oh, it has yeah. the most number of citizens. Oh my gosh. Right? Mm, mm, so mm. if Facebook, if you start thinking of Facebook as a country, I mean, in the digital world, and Facebook start issuing their own currency, which is the Facebook Libra or DM, whatever they want to call it these days, the Facebook dollar. Mm-hmm. And then you start thinking that, you know, then, then the governments will eventually start losing more and more of their power, right? And governments have a lot of power these days via the currency that they have. So uh, that's why a lot of governments are very against Facebook because the Facebook's plan of launching their digital currency is, is not 
packed to the US dollar, but it's kind of packed to a basket of currency, the US dollar, the Euro, the British pound, Singapore dollar, I think, and the Tokyo, uh, Japanese yen. That was the original plan and all the governments were against it because if they're doing 20% for five different currencies, what is going to stop Facebook from sometime in the future say like, okay, let's just say uh, 50%, I don't like US dollar, let's put like 50% Singapore dollar, 50% Japanese yen, and then 0% US dollar. Oh. Then like suddenly everybody in the US is trading Facebook dollar without US, using US dollar at all. Right. It's kind of like very, very, very tough situation. So that's why there's a lot of um, uh, pushback from the government. So I think that plan has been abandoned. Now they, I think they are sort of launching some sort of a US dollar pack coin or not, but like the, the thing is still not announced, but but yeah, that's kind of where essentially money is going. Whether or not it would be Bitcoin, we don't know, but Bitcoin could be the basis of foundation for some other things as well. I mean, the concept, I think what I would say is that the concept of money is very fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, what we think is true about money that has been true for the past 30, 40 years or so, has not really been the case and 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 can change because mm. the concept of money changed very drastically in 1971 when the when the when President Richard Nixon took it off the gold dollar. A lot of people did not realize that and kind of like those who realized kind of obviously got really rich, but those who didn't realize it obviously get I mean struggle lah in the next the few decades. <laughs> so I say that money as a concept is a very fluid concept and and it can change again. How it will change in the future in the next few decades we don't know, but. If you ask me, do I think that money in the future will look the same as money today? I think it will be quite different. Uh. Right. If, if I may ask, so you know, you seem very, uh, what's the word, very optimistic and very forward-looking when it comes to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm just curious, I'm just putting a, a, a hypothetical scenario. Let's say, you know, uh, the Malaysia's finance minister asks you, hey, Bobby, what should Malaysia do when it comes to our fiscal policy and Bitcoin, you know, how, how can we uh, hedge against the future with cryptocurrency? Do we buy? Do we not buy? Do we regulate? What would you say to the finance minister? Not necessarily the one now, but uh, a hypothetical finance minister. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it's interesting, right, what we are seeing right now. I mean, when, when, when corporations start, like corporations like Tesla start putting a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin in their mm. balance sheet, like, I think that's kind of like, the, the, the narrative has changed a lot already. It used to be like some normal guys, tech tech guys, tech bros, that nerds all playing this thing and then used to be drug dealers playing Bitcoin. But like, but when, when, when large corporations start doing this Tesla and Tesla, I, I guarantee you that Tesla won't be the last company that will be buying Bitcoin. There will be more <laughs> larger companies buying. They just haven't announced it yet. They just waiting mm. to acquire a large enough position before they announce it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a matter of time before governments start holding Bitcoin in their balance sheet. So, <laughs> Uh, that's kind of like, yeah, mind blowing, right? So, it is. Uh, so I think the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, has kind of yeah. already said that he wants to have uh, Bitcoin on the Miami government, local government's balance sheet. And then he wants to find a way to allow the Miami government to pay uh, their employees in Bitcoin or to let their citizens pay taxes in Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, how you affect the US dollar, I don't know, but, but, but I mean, the, the, the gene is out, of, the idea is out, right? I mean, and, and if, 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 I mean, he's obviously a very progressive politician and he, he's doing all this to kind of attract a certain kind of people to relocate to Miami and to build their businesses and to pay taxes in Miami, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we have an opportunity if we want to attract all these kind of people to differentiate ourselves. And if mm -hmm. we kind of put in place a very progressive policy, let the world know that we stand for this, this and that. And, right. and you know, we have the opportunity because it's always kind of like, it's competition, right? Every country is kind of competing against each other to one up their competitor and see how they can differentiate themselves. So if we can find a way to differentiate ourselves and attract talent, attract companies to kind of build here, then, you know, that is a uh, opportunity. Um, yeah. I mean, we can do it early or we can be a second, uh, follow someone else. Now. Let someone else follow them. Yeah. You know, it's always a race, Wait, you know, we are going to follow Singapore. I'm sure uh, Singapore is going to lead the pack. You know, they already started doing research in this kind of stuff. So uh, Actually, I really hope- credit, credits, credits to Securities Commission of Malaysia. La. I mean, yeah. it came out with the regulatory framework. Uh, yeah. I think it was before Singapore. Singapore is still kind of yes. going through their Payment Services Act. Uh, actually, surprisingly, behind Thailand, Thailand was kind of the first country to put out this uh, uh, regulatory framework. So they gave out license exchanges. There's a few in, in Thailand, I think five these days. Oh. Uh, they're also doing a- ICO, they have an ICO framework in Thailand as well. So the SC is doing a IEO, Initial Exchange Offering Framework. I think they are inviting people to come apply for licenses right now. So I think they are quite progressive in that sense. So, so, but, but I guess you can ask what's next. And then we will, 
because now like if you think about it, central banks all they have like they they hold a basket of foreign foreign currency US dollar Japanese yen yep. uh, Swiss fran- uh, Swiss francs and so on. But I guess the question that we are asking is will at some point central banks start holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet uh, to back their local currency? You know, you're shaking your head right now, right? But, <laughs> but, 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 you know, it's kind of like, maybe not now, but maybe in five years time. Right? I feel, I feel oh, it's already in the, in the talks right yeah. now. It is in the talks. There yeah. are some big bankers who are already trying to do their research and, 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 and find out more about Bitcoin. But uh, I just want to double back into the whole Facebook currency. I think it's a fantastic idea. If they haven't got a name for their their freaking digital currency, I would name it Face. So anytime you people say, how much are, hey, give Face lah, give Face. <laughs> 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 give Face lah. Hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this for free? Cannot. Okay, give Face lah, give Face. Yeah. I, I I was sorry. I was shaking my head because my mind was uh, my mind was being blown by uh, by that. You know, when it's it's surreal when you hear those words. You know, it's it's insane. I've been reading those words, <laughs> but when you hear it by someone, like it's it's absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> um, so that was a macro question, but in terms of micro, okay, and and this is the question that which is a, uh, you know, I just want to pick your brain. So, Bobby, which coin should I buy? <laughs> <laughs> For yeah, very, I, I always give this this advice and I've been repeating this like for the past five years actually uh, for most people, <laughs> it's a very boring boring advice uh, but like okay. um, the answer is very simple is buy dollar cost average your entry into Bitcoin oh. and buy a little bit amount each month and try to have an aim to collect one Bitcoin in your life mm. yeah. you see you heard that not Jin you uh, heard that not okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I'm doing that while I'm dollar cost averaging every minute yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Oh man, okay. For those of you who don't know what dollar cost averaging is, I think it's a very common strategy that's been used by a lot of people when it comes to invest, not only in crypto, but also in stocks as well, or in investments to mm. kind of lessen your risk when it comes to to getting a better average with your investments and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I okay, so we, we've always focused a lot more about Bitcoin, but the thing is, let me add, let me add, let me add on a little bit there just now. Okay. Right? So, yeah, so my, my advice is say like, for example, it doesn't really matter how much you want to purchase, right? So like, just set aside like a percentage of portfolio. Say like you have fifty thousand ring, you're worth fifty thousand ringgit. Yep. Just and you set aside like five percent or ten percent, whatever amount, right? So if you said like ten percent, that's five thousand ringgit, right? So, mm-hmm. and you can say like, okay, every month that you get your salary, then put like hundred ringgit on the first of the month you buy it on Luno or tokenized or Synergy, for example, hundred ringgit worth of Bitcoin, and just buy it diligently every month regardless of the price and then the price will go up the price will go down okay. don't sell just hold for five seven ten just hold forever or just think of it like your epf just hold forever because right. if if it works out well right if the price really really like, i mean these are all like quite we don't know what will happen but if like really more large companies buy bitcoin if like governments start buying bitcoin then the price will be like what we are seeing now is just nothing compared to what we'll see in the future, right? So, so it's always the hardest part is, I guess for most people is just not touching it, lah, buying and holding for a long time. A lot of people think that, you know, you, oh, one Bitcoin is 50,000 US dollar. That's like 200,000 ringgit. That's like one freaking ha- like half a house, one small condominium or whatever. Like cannot afford anymore. But like, it doesn't really matter. You can have fractional and just collect it over time. The hardest part is to not be, you know, uh, not be influenced by the price movement and to hold on over a long period of time. Of course, if you want to, you know, speculate on some of the other coins, then yeah, but that requires, you can put aside a smaller percentage of that and kind of speculate, but but that's kind of like a whole different strategy, like a lot of work, monitoring, finding out, researching, you know, if like for the most simplest, simplest one is just buy a small amount of Bitcoin every month, kind of hold it for five, 10 years and then see where it goes. Uh. Right. Um, Jin, so I just want to ask one question uh, for, uh, to Bo- uh, Bobby. Um, so Bobby, recently I, uh, I, I I posted in the cryptocurrency Facebook group. Uh, I just asked uh, the question, can someone please explain to me what is DeFi? Because I have read a lot about it. I've heard a lot about it. I'm trying to understand it uh, and, and I had some difficulties. So then one of your uh, one of your team members actually emailed me uh, your uh, CoinGecko's book, How to DeFi. You know, a uh, really nicely written book. If you, and you can you summarize for me what exactly is DeFi and and more importantly, how can we benefit from it? Yeah, so DeFi stands for decentralized finance, and essentially, what is happening in the crypto space now is every you can think of every financial services that is offered by your bank is being replicated in a decentralized manner. 
And um, essentially what is happening now is you can think of your pawn shop that, that uh, Gene was talking about where you can put your gold and get the money out, right? Yep. So that's kind of happening in the crypto space as well. So you can kind of like, you can think of your Bitcoin as your gold. You can go to this digital pawn shop and put your pledge your Bitcoin and then you can draw out a US dollar loan. And then you can kind of like take the US dollar and do whatever you want to like buy or buy more, buy more coin, buy more Bitcoin or, or just pay some bills or whatever. So uh, that's one. They are... There are there are there are exchanges that are being so Luno is a centralized exchange and basically you have to trust Luno to you know but they have all these uh, measures to make sure that they don't do bad things. Uh, you have to trust Luno to keep your funds safe. So but now there are there are decentralized exchanges where you kind of keep the funds by yourself. Yeah. And you can still trade on on online and on on all these platforms and all. So I think a lot of things is being moved to a decentralized manner, and um, I think I think why people are interested in this in DeFi is because a lot of these protocols, they, they pay a yield. And uh, I think if you think about it, um, if you put money in the FD account, like you get like 3%, for example, but in, in crypto, it's like you, 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 can, you can have a US dollar coin and you get like a 7, 8% interest on the coin. And that's kind of on the lowest base. Those people that, that have more sophisticated strategies and techniques, they can be getting 30, 40% on the stable coins or even some of the more crazy strategy can go up to hundred or even higher percent. So, but all these things have different risk reward and like you have to really study some of these things. Some of them are easier and risk uh, is uh, better, but some of them uh, are riskier. So I guess that's where people, are, that's why a lot of people in the world is looking into this uh, because for many people, their bank, bank account, FD pay 0% or sometimes negative, you have to pay the bank to put money in the bank, which is like kind of quite unthinkable several years ago, but it's happening in many Western countries right now. Lah. Right. So, okay. So yeah. this, it, 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 you think you're, it's going to be the, 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 the usage of DeFi will at least match centralized finance in the near future? Yeah, I think for, for many, many, many things has already matched. So uh, oh, like wow. you look at the largest crypto centralized crypto exchanges uh crypto exchange uh coinbase binance for example Co coinbase right so coinbase is like one of the most regulated us exchange similar like to luno in malaysia right so we used to think that you know using decentralized exchange was very clunky very hard and the learning curve is quite steep you no know, not very simple for a person to use and there's no way that anyone there's no way that a decentralized exchange like Unis a decentralized exchange that Uniswap can match the volume that is done on Coinbase. But essentially what we saw last year is the volume on Uniswap is as high as Coinbase. So uh, that is actually a very, very surprising thing. Like it caught us by surprise as well. Like, I mean, caught me definitely by surprise because I never have thought that a decentralized exchange could do as much volume as a centralized equivalent. Uh, so what we're seeing is that a shift in how people in the crypto space are preferring to interact and, uh, uh, I think what you're seeing is that a lot of other these platforms, they're all building up and eventually they all gain more popularity, more volume, and they may be doing better than their centralized equivalent. So wow. in other words, decentralized finance is kind of like enabling people to be their own banks. Am I right? Yep. So right. yep. it's like every wallet or every bank, like your own bank is whatever you carry around with you that's most convenient, whether in this case, your mobile phone. I mean, there are some products out there that allows you to store all of your Bitcoin or your cryptocurrencies in there and also gain uh, basic uh, interest rates like an FD. And you can uh, kind of like put them up for loans, like stake it. And in this, in this uh, thing, they call it stake it. Like, you know, you can put it into this fund where they can actually loan it out to people and the people will pay back the interests and you get the bigger end of it as compared to the banks. It's, it's, it's technically what banks are doing. They're taking our savings, loaning them out to people to buy houses, cars, uh, whatever they want, and they're paying back their loans with interest. And then they take the bigger end of the percentage, giving us the small FD rate that we get on a yearly basis. So that's- yep, Actually, what you say is true. La. It's essentially that, but now it's done by a- uh smart contract or a piece of code like even more abstract than <laughs> now you think about it right yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you be your bank you you send your money to a piece of code and this money will you know lend it out to people who wants the money that you have and then they pay you an interest on it like yeah the uncle's brain mind blown what are you doing <laughs> yeah but how okay. can you trust your money to the matrix you're giving your money to the matrix i know but the, skynet but here's a question i would ask though okay you could do that you could basically uh, loan out your Bitcoin. Okay, stake it. Okay, in this case, loaning out your Bitcoin means staking your Bitcoin to someone who wants to basically take a loan. What if they don't pay it back? What happens? 
So the, so yeah. Uh, at this at this point in time, right? So when you when you go to a bank, you borrow money. Say you you buy a house and you you take a loan on the house. If you don't pay back your loan, the bank takes over the possession of your house, right? And yep. then they can sell it for whatever they want. It's the same for a car. If you don't pay your car loan, the bank takes over your car and sells your car, right? Yep. And and the bank's collateral, your house, your car, is usually worth more than what amount that you borrow. So if you borrow like 500,000 to buy a 800,000 house, if you don't pay your loan, then you know everything is gone. Same right. for a car. So the same thing for crypto, right? If you want to borrow like $1,000, for example, most places requires you to put in a collateral ratio of 150%. So you have to put in like $150, $1,500 worth of another crypto asset. So for example, you put $1,500 worth of Bitcoin and you can draw out $1,000 worth of Ether. Right. Ooh, I see. And, yeah. this, and this is basically governed by the smart contracts. Lah. Yes, yes. Because you can see how much money is worth. You see, so you deposit something and then you withdraw something that is less. So this guy can't fake it. He has to basically, has, ha, he, he, got, he has to have some collateral that's legit and that's basically yep. uh, validated in order for them to be eligible to take out that loan. Okay, now I get it. So that's why, I, oh, okay. So that's why smart contracts, okay, works. Okay. And, oh, okay, not bad. I like to give a round of applause for that. It took me so long to understand this. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because I thought it was Actually, just it's a very sim- similar yeah. to the digital pawn shop analogy. Like you put your, you put a, you, you can pledge your goal, which is worth a thousand ringgit, for example. And then you say, I want to borrow 500 ringgit. Yeah. You can sell your goal at the shop, at the gold shop for, I mean, 500, a thousand ringgit, or you can kind of pledge the, the gold bar or your gold chain or whatever at the pawn shop. So it's kind of the same thing, but a digital version. Uh, yeah. Right. But the, and this digital version is, you know, basically governed by smart contracts that it's being overlooked yeah. by everybody in the whole wide world uh, because it's an open ledger, yeah. right? Like you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, Jason yeah. is probably smiling because like, yay, finally Jin is not stupid anymore. <laughs> but okay. That's, no, no, no. That's, that's, that's I've been saying, no, no, no. We are both stupid in NFT, uh, in, in De- DeFi. So we, yeah. it's nice to learn. Okay. Yeah, because like I've been talking to Jason, I've been sending him stuff like, "Hey, check this out, man! It's, it sounds like as if you can be your own bank." And then you know, but the thing yeah. is, it's it sounds so simple. It sounds like it's so easy for anyone to be their own bank. But then again, you have a lot of these uh, cases where you know you have certain exchanges who 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 promise you this, promise you that. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you heard about this whole thing, BitConnect or whatever, be, oh, which yeah. you know runs away with your money and stuff like that. But you know. I, I, I think like this whole decentralized finance or Bitcoin is still in its infant stage. I would still think it's still in its infancy lah, before there are more uh, streamlined ways to, to make sure that everything is governed properly. Hopefully not by governments. I, I don't know. But okay, that's that's very interesting. Jason, you have any more questions? I know I know you have a lot of questions, you know? Oh no no uh, well no no I mean uh, that's that's plenty for, for one podcast. Uh the what what do you think the future is for Bitcoin? Bitcoin as globally and for Malaysia in in, in like what's what's next for Bitcoin? Um, I think I think this is a, a trend that you can't stop, right? Whether you like it or not, uh, the genie's out of the bottle. Like I think if you don't know what is Bitcoin or don't really understand what what we are blabbing today, uh, I highly recommend that you go out and read like, what it is and spend some time educating yourself because if you don't educate yourself now five years on the road, this thing, you still be around and you still be wondering what the hell is Bitcoin? Mm. So <laughs> you better take the time and learn top down, left, right, everything that you can about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the easiest way I find for myself to learn is I put a small amount of money and then kind of see how the money flow and mm-hmm. kind of feel. So you can always try opening an account with Luno or tokenize or Synergy and try to see what it's like buying your first Bitcoin. Uh, and don't speculate too much if you don't like. But 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 yeah, I would say education is key. Uh, I mean, we just released a book, uh, How to Bitcoin at CoinGecko. You can kind of go and uh, buy it or collect some candy, some some points and, and redeem it for free. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I would say r- just learn it because whether you're lucky or not, it's going to be here, here in a few years' time. Uh, if anything, like I would foresee that I would guess that more and more, you start having more and more headlines, like bigger, bigger people, like talking about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or some other equivalent. Because once you start going to Bitcoin, there's actually, it's quite a deep learning curve. There's so many other things and, and everything is kind of developing at a very rapid pace in its own way. Yep. Like you have people like Mark Cuban or Gary, Gary Vee, Gary Vaynerchuk talking about NFT. You kind of mentioned a little bit. Yeah. I don't want to talk about NFT today, but that, that's like a whole different uh, thing. That is <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different story deep, altogether. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah, I would say go and learn. 
like that's why I tell everyone five years ago, go and learn. They didn't want to learn. Elon <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Musk is buying, right? So, because yeah. you, you see the younger the younger generation these days, right? They're not learning. They just want to earn. You know, the word of mouth is like, hey, you so, can you can earn money so, with Bitcoin. You can earn money with Bitcoin. You know, that's that's what's going on, and that's why people get into it. They get into it because they think it's a get rich uh, quick scheme. It's like, hey, you buy this yeah. coin, right? Confirm go up one, and then they they buy, and then it goes down twenty percent. Then they are like, oh my god, I want to cut my losses, and they sell. A lot of kids are doing this. I won't lie. They are basically like just the other day when uh, Elon Musk was tweeting about Dogecoin, all these young farts on Twitter are basically, you know, tweeting pictures of dogs uh, saying that, you know, this Dogecoin is making me money. Oh my God, I'm 200x to the moon. And they're all doing that. These are people that you don't think would even bother about all these things. They're people who don't know what exchanges are trading or whatever. And all of a sudden they're like, Dogecoin to the moon. It's like Dogecoin is the future. And I'm like, I don't know whether that's borderline... Uh, uh, irresponsible, Gambling. irresponsible of Elon Musk to do that. To be honest, because you know he's a very influential man. A lot of kids kind of look up to him. I mean, believe or like it or not, he a lot of kids do follow him. By him doing that, it's kind of I would say a little bit. Ir- I mean, I was uh, for, to me like, I think it's irresponsible. Like, but what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think I think I think if you want to, I mean, you should. Yes, there's a lot of opportunity to make money, but I think it's better to kind of understand why you're making money instead of being lucky. I mean, you can be lucky, you know, making money, but like you can be lucky once, lucky twice, lucky three times, but like how many more times can you keep up this lucky streak? But mm-hmm. if you really understand and then you know why you're making the money, why, where's the demand coming from and all. And, uh, and then what you say, because it's very volatile, right? Sometimes you need to have conviction whenever it goes down. Do you kind of cut your losses and leave or do you kind of you know, double down or... You kind of must know, but sometimes it's very hard to say, lah. But, but, and and for many people, you kind of start to see the macro environment. Why are people buying into all these things as well? Right. Yeah, I mean, Dogecoin, Elon Musk saying such things. Um, I mean, he can say whatever he wants, uh, freedom of speech, right? But I mean, if you go and listen to him and you lose money, that's on you, lah. I would say, yeah, you didn't do your own research. <laughs> um, if you make money, good on you, or you're lucky. But if you lose money, then why you go listen to someone else and just follow blindly? <laughs> My, my, my take on this kind of gambling, right, Jin, is like, you know, the best thing that can happen to them is they lose on the first gamble. Yeah. Because like oh, a gambling yeah, you're addict, right, you're if, right. They, if they win a bit, win a bit, then they're, you know, they will keep, they will never go, ah, I'm going to stop now. The gambling ending won't, won't stop. They'll continue and then one day lose massive and then that's it. It's yeah, over. It's over. So, okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning as well when it comes to speculation and all like, I mean, there's a lot of exchanges offering you ability to trade with leverage, like hundred X leverage, you know, like, like just, just don't do that. Like, I mean, yeah. unless you know what you're doing, uh, unless you really know what you're doing, um, better to trade the spot market. Don't, don't borrow money, like borrow money and trading anything is, uh, it's like the Along story. Uh, you can just, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I right. think, I think the best thing we can say to everyone listening right now is I think that the best thing is to understand what you're getting yourself into rather than trying to gamble because when you don't know anything and get into something you do not know, hoping for a great return, I think that's called gambling. You, you don't gamble with your hard earned money and, and, and stuff like that. But, uh, I think like uh, Bobby, I just want to say thank you very much for your time today on taking time off to come on uh, on this show to talk to us about what uh, cryptocurrency is all about. I know it won't be the last. I'll be bugging you again because <laughs> you know, you know, all of a sudden there are certain things that are going around the world. I would love to get your input and your and your uh, feedback about it. But uh, before we go, would you like to say anything? Um, yeah, I think I've said everything really. Um, use Coin Gecko uh, and. Um, <laughs> Download our books, read our books, and learn as much as you can. Like knowledge that you have up here, nobody can take it away from you. So, always upskill yourself. All right, cool. I, 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 I well, I'm looking at my laptop because my laptop battery is about to die. But thank you so much for your time, Jason. Thank you so much for barging in. But uh, for those of you listening, thank you so much for tuning in. And I uh, hope you took away something for today's episode. If you want to invest into Bitcoin, yes, do it. But of course, hey, make sure you all uh, don't throw your life savings in there because uh, it's not our fault. We're not financial advisors, okay? And if you want to find out more information about CoinGecko, our website is www.coingecko.com. Am I correct? That's right. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, you can stream us on Spotify. You can stream us on Google Podcasts. You can stream us on uh, Apple Podcasts as well. And if you want to follow our socials, please do so. It is Mamak Sessions. Speak to you next time, guys.